In this video, we'll be discussing pre-mRNA processing. Specifically, we're going to talk about the measures taken by the cell to prevent the degradation of a transcribed RNA molecule and the processes used by a cell to join the necessary fragments, the exons, and get rid of the unnecessary ones, the introns. Let's take a look. To begin, let's remember that even though both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells have DNA and RNA, the specific type of pre-mRNA processing that we're talking about in this course refers to what happens in the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell. So remember, a prokaryotic cell does not have a nucleus. So the specific nuclear pre-mRNA processing that we are talking about in this course is referring to the RNA processing in a eukaryotic cell. So in mRNA processing, we're essentially preparing this molecule of RNA that we've transcribed to be transported out of the nucleus into the cytosol. If you remember back to the primary structure of RNA, you'll remember that an RNA nucleotide has a two prime hydroxyl group, meaning that in cytosolic conditions with certain enzymes and molecules present, RNA molecules are rapidly degraded because of this instability. To overcome some of these inherent instabilities and also to facilitate the binding of RNA to ribosomes during translation, several modifications are made. The first is the addition of the five prime cap. Shown here is the five prime end of an RNA molecule. So the cap is added and additionally, all the two prime hydroxyl groups near the five prime end as well as several of the bases near the five prime end are methylated. Now what does this methylation do? This methylation is going to prevent these hydroxyl groups from being as reactive. So it decreases the risk of having this molecule be degraded once it enters the cytosol. Additionally, let's take a look over here at the addition of this 7-methylguanosine. So what does 7-methylguanosine mean? So recall from chapter 10 that guanosine refers to a guanine nucleoside. So this guanine nucleoside is a 7-methyl nucleoside, meaning that on position 7, which is a nitrogen, we have a methyl group. And you see that instead of just a standard phosphodiester bond, we have three phosphates joined together, which, FYI for biochemistry, this is called a phosphoanhydride bond. So all that to say, We've stabilized this molecule by methylating these hydroxyl groups and various reactive groups around our base rings, as well as adding this 7-methylguanosine, which is going to act as a marker and a stabilizer, which is going to help us find ribosomes during translation. So next, let's look at polyadenylation. Polyadenylation is kind of like a different means to the same end as 5' cap addition, meaning that we are adding something to one of the ends of our mRNA molecule to increase its stability in the cytosol and to facilitate the binding to a ribosome and the stability of translation. In our freshly transcribed mRNA molecule, we're going to have a few important landmarks. Let's first start by denoting the 3' prime and the 5' prime ends. Near the 3' prime end, we're going to have a U-rich segment. We are also going to have an important consensus sequence called the AAUAA -A -A sequence. Roughly 11 to 30 nucleotides downstream from this AAUA -A -A consensus sequence, we're going to have a cleavage site. At this cleavage site, enzymes will come in and cleave off the 3' prime end of this transcript. And after we cleave this 3' prime section, to our new 3' prime end, we are going to add a segment of roughly 50 to 250 adenosine bases. A really easy way to remember the identity of this sequence is if you're having a really hard time studying and you just can't think of what it is, you can just go, ah, and then you know it. And that's polyadenylation. And now we have a pre-mRNA molecule with a 5' prime cap and a poly-A tail, which is ready to be further modified. The next part of pre-mRNA processing is RNA splicing. RNA splicing is going to do two things. It's going to remove introns, which are sections of mRNA that are only going to stay inside of the nucleus, thus we can call it an intron, and it's going to ligate together exons, and exons are expressed. Splicing is carried out by spliceosomes, and spliceosomes are made of five SNRNPs. An SNRNP stands for a small nuclear ribonucleic protein, and each of these SNRNPs is made up of one SNRNA, or small nuclear RNA, and a bunch of proteins. For this class, there are five different SNRNPs that you have to know, and thus, these five SNRNPs make up these spliceosomes, and these are going to be U1, U2, 
u4, u5, and u6. And please note that there is no u3. So now, let's take a look at how these spliceosomes are going to remove introns and join exons. So we're going to draw these exons in orange and the intron in green. Now let's make special note that we're going to have 5 prime down here and 3 prime down here, as is generally the convention. So with any intron, we're going to have a 5 prime and a 3 prime cleavage site. And although for this course you don't have to worry about the specific mechanism for this, please know that your spliceosome is going to make a cut at the 5' prime cleavage site. The cleaved 5' prime end is going to loop around, and it's going to make a 5 to 2 phosphodiester bond with an adenosine base. Next, we're going to have cleavage at the 3' prime splice site. After cleavage at the 3' prime splice site, the now free 5' prime and 3' prime end of these two exons are going to be joined together by your spliceosome, and that's going to make one complete mRNA molecule that can go to be translated. In addition to this, we're going to form a structure called the lariat with this loop section of intron that we removed. This lariat will go on to be broken down into its individual nucleotides, which will then be recycled and used in further rounds of transcription. At this point, we now have a mature mRNA molecule that can go and be translated. But first, it's worth mentioning that there are several other ways that we can go about processing. So in the realm of alternative processing, we talk about two specific types in this course. The first is going to be alternate splicing. With alternative splicing, we can have multiple different combinations with how we actually put together these exons after they're spliced. So we could just have the expected, where we have exons 1, 2, and 3 that come together. Or we could also have just exons 1 and 2, or exons 1 and 3, or so on. And so thus, from one single molecule of mRNA, we could get multiple different gene products. This can be useful to the body because it allows more adaptability with fewer genes. In addition to alternative splicing, we also have alternative 3' cleavage. In alternative 3' cleavage, we could have multiple different cleavage sites at the 3' end. Thus, during polyadenylation, we could actually form multiple different products. And so, in theory, in a gene with multiple 3' cleavage sites, you could potentially cut in the middle of an exon and change the gene product produced. And so these shown here are ways that eukaryotic cell may actually express more protein products than the number of genes they actually have, showing the adaptability of these types of cells. With the processing of ribosomal RNA, or rRNA, it's important to note that in eukaryotic cells, it's going to happen in the nucleolus, which is at the core of the nucleus, and it's going to be aided by small nuclear RNA. And in prokaryotes, it's going to happen in the cytosol because they don't have a nucleus. RNA is measured in Svedbergs. Svedbergs are a unit of weight that describes fractionalization, but they don't necessarily add together to give the mass of these ribosomal subunits. For example, in a prokaryotic cell, you'll have a large 50S subunit and a small 30S subunit. However, the entire complex is called the 70S complex. In eukaryotes, you have a 40S small subunit and a 60S large subunit, and these come together to form the 80S complex. With tRNA processing, the majority of it is going to happen on the anticodon arm, and other things that may happen to it is you may add rare bases or modify bases. I hope you found this video really helpful. The concepts and information presented in these videos will be true no matter what genetics class you are taking. However, the concepts presented in this video are referencing material currently covered in Baylor University's coursework. Remember, if you are currently enrolled as a Baylor student, we offer free tutoring services. Our tutoring center is located on the first floor of the Sid Richardson Building. You will find all the details you need to know about these services on our website, www.baylor.edu. tutoring You may schedule a free 30-minute one-on-one tutoring session online through Navigate or just drop in during our open business hours. For more information about our current services, please visit our website. Thank you.